Celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. Welcome aboard. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. We welcome our listeners around the world. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1151 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Amateur radio on board the International Space Station Columbus module has been repaired and is operational. We will have the details on the fix. The ARRL announces incumbent section managers will begin new terms on April 1st. We will tell you who they are. The QSO Today virtual ham exposition was a success despite several technical issues and opens the on-demand period. Colorado Aries teams provide communications during a record blizzard. The Dayton Hamvention has announced its 2021 award winners. We will have all the details. German amateur radio operators have been active this week requesting the availability of online amateur exams. The European equivalent of the Dayton Hamvention, the Friedrich Schaven Hamfest, is on track for June 25th to the 27th. Maybe. WWVB is upgrading its transmission facility, so NIST has announced periodic outages during the upgrade period. And yes, after a 14-year wait, Echolink for Windows is finally available. And we will tell you about March 13th, 1989, which is known as the day the sun brought darkness and a large coronal mass ejection hit the earth. We will have the story for you in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, has quite a bit to talk about this week. He will talk about the newly implemented Snoopers Act, better known as the Investigatory Powers Act in the UK. He will take a look at the new Starlink satellite cluster launch. He'll investigate how Australia is implementing an internet link tax. Leo will also update the story from last week concerning the zero-day exploits to Microsoft Exchange email, and will tell us about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will be along, and he will be making a few observations this week. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us all the way back to the 1970s and the proposed FCC amateur radio restructuring proposal. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about rules that you should follow for transmitter lockout tagout procedures before climbing on a commercial tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where spring is sprung, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, and all ready for the official start of spring, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station, high atop one of New York's Catskill Mountains, where things are greening up nicely and large flocks of robins have been observed amongst the maple trees. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where spring most decidedly has not quite sprung, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where mornings are like winter and afternoons are like spring, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, kind of wishing Mother Nature would make up her mind already. And now, with our lead story this week, here is Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Some six weeks after going silent following a spacewalk that installed a new antenna cabling, the amateur radio on the International Space Station ham station in the Columbus module is once again operational. The Columbus station, which typically uses the call sign NA1SS, is the primary Eris amateur radio station used for school contacts and other activities. 
A January 27th spacewalk replaced a coax feed line installed 11 years ago with another built by the European Space Agency and Airbus. While the specific cause of the problem has not yet been determined, a March 13th spacewalk that restored the antenna cabling to its original configuration provided the cure. The plan to return the ARIS cabling to its original configuration had been a contingency task for a March 5th spacewalk, but the astronauts ran out of time. The ARIS work was appended to the to-do list for astronauts Mike Hopkins, KF5LJG, and Victor Glover, KI5BKC, to complete a week later. On behalf of the ARIS International Team, our heartfelt thanks to all who helped ARIS work through the cable anomaly investigation, troubleshooting, and ultimate repair, ARIS International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, said. Bauer praised NASA, the ESA, Airbus, and ARIS Russia lead Sergei Sambarov, RV3DR. While the Columbus ham station was off the air, Air's school and group contacts were able to continue using the ham station in the ISS service module on the Russian side of the station. During the weekend spacewalk, Hopkins swapped out a cable for the Bartolomeo commercial payload handling platform that had been installed in series with the Air's VHF UHF antenna feed line, returning the Air's system to its pre January 27th configuration. Hopkins raised a question concerning a sharp bend in the cable near a connector, but no further adjustments were possible. On March 14th, Aris was able to confirm the operation's success when automatic packet reporting system signals on 145.825 MHz were heard in California, Utah, and Idaho as the ISS passed overhead. Aris team member Christy Hunter KB6LTY was able to digipete through NA1SS during the pass. With additional confirmation from stations in South America and the Middle East, ARIS declared the radio system operational again. Work during the March 13th spacewalk also made Bartolomeo operational. Yesterday was a great day for all, Bauer exulted. The return to service of the ARIS Columbus radio was especially good news to school children in Adelaide, Australia, who were able to keep their date with astronaut Shannon Walker, KD5DXB, on March 17th. Now that the radio's antenna connection is fixed, the grateful students at Goodwood Primary School have become the first phone contact made with a newly reconnected Columbus module radio. Next up will be students at the Oakwood School in Morgan Hill, California, on Monday, March 22nd. And then, two days later, it's back to Down Under with students at the School of Information Technology and Mathematical Sciences in Mawson Lakes, South Australia. Eight incumbent ARRL section managers who were unopposed for re-election in the winter election cycle will begin their new terms on April 1st. They are Rick Paquette, W7RAP in Arizona, James Ferguson, and 5LKE in Arkansas, Lelia Garner, WA0UIG in Iowa, Steve Morgan, W4NHO in Kentucky, Malcolm McCown, W5XRay X-ray in Mississippi, Paul Stiles, KF7SOJ in Montana, Stephen Lott Smith, KG5VK in North Texas, and Rick Branninger, N1TEK in Wyoming. Because no nominating petitions were received from the ARRL Orange Section by December 4th of 2020, the candidates for the Office of the Orange Section Manager will be re-solicited. Notices appear in the April and May issues of QST to elicit candidates for the 18-month term starting October 1st of 2021. Incumbent Orange Section Manager Carl Gardenius, WU6D, decided not to run for another term after serving since 2003. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo attracted thousands of participants over the March 13th and 14th weekend. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more. 
taking a different tack than it did for its inaugural event last August. The Expo leveraged the capabilities of two virtual event platforms to increase interaction among attendees, speakers, and exhibitors. All did not go smoothly, however, and technical issues arose. 80 presentations now are available for on-demand viewing. Go to www.qsotodayhamexpo.com. ARRL, a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner, enjoyed virtual visits to its lab and membership services and field services representatives. Senior test engineer Bob Allison, WB1GCM, live streamed from inside the lab screen room where QST product review testing is conducted. CEO David Minster, NA2AA, delivered the event's keynote address. Minster said ARRL would become a bigger player in the digital age. A major part of the digital transformation at ARRL has to do with taking our excellence in content development and editing and bringing it to video. You are seeing more activity from us on YouTube, the Learning Network, and then later this year, the launch of our Learning Center. Video has established itself as a modern approach for mentoring and elmering. It's on all the time, available to fit your schedule. It's easy to pause, repeat, and refer back to. QSO Today's Eric Guth 4Z1UG apologized afterward for the poor experience many participants had in accessing and navigating the event. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Unfortunately, we had many technical issues with the AirMeet presentations and the integration of the VFairs and AirMeet platforms. Expo Chairman Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, WA6IGR explained afterward in a message to participants. All recorded presentations are available for attendees during the Expo's 30-day on-demand access period, which ends April 16th. The other exhibit highlighted the expertise of ARRL laboratory personnel. RFI engineer Paul Cianciolo, W1VLF, who helped participants deal with pesky noise and interference issues. W1AW station manager Joe Garcia, WJ1Q, conducted virtual tours of the Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Station all weekend. All told, 16 staff members worked in rotating shifts at ARRL headquarters, greeting visitors through live streaming video and audio. Several members of the ARRL board of directors were on the platform, too. Amateur radio manufacturers and vendors, including Flex Radio, Elecraft, Connect Systems, and Quicksilver Radio Products welcomed visitors and answered their questions on a one-to-one -one basis. Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, had attempted to integrate a number of systems together in order to make a better user experience, he explained. It was a noble idea because I wanted the convention, like last August, with the lounge tables of AirMeet to make it more interactive. We failed on this platform for many of you. I am very sorry. One of the things that we've stressed in all our communications is that the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo team is committed to constantly learning and improving what we do, Guth said in a statement. Virtual conventions of this magnitude are new territory. We believe that there's a place for a virtual ham expo to serve the needs of the very large amateur radio community, especially those that don't attend in person, national or regional events, or even local events. We are committed to making that happen. Once again, the Expo announced on Wednesday, March 17th, that 80 presentations had already been added to the platform for on-demand viewing. After a 14-year hiatus, the developers are pleased to announce that Echolink for Windows version 2.1 is now available. Echolink software allows licensed amateur radio stations to communicate with each other over the internet using streaming audio technology, but the program also allows conventional amateur radio equipment to be connected to the internet network, meaning that worldwide communications can be made between radio stations or from computer to radio station, greatly enhancing amateur radio's communications capabilities.
There are more than 300,000 validated users worldwide in 151 of the world's 193 nations, with about 6,000 online at any time. You can download the latest Echolink version from secure.echolink.org forward slash news. Members of Arapahoe County Aries were deployed and ready for a snowstorm in Colorado that was declared Denver's fourth largest since 1881 and the second largest ever in March. After spending Saturday, March 13th on standby, 19 hams went into action the next morning, providing reports on weather and road conditions even as the snow continued unabated. Mike Kurta, KD0UFO, the Severe Weather Coordinator for the Aries Group, said that the nearly 28 inches of snow fell in a little more than 24 hours and winds kicked up to 40 miles per hour. By Monday, March 15th, the hams had logged more than 260 hours working in support of the county sheriff's department as well as the city of Aurora. They assisted local agencies as officials got busy handling numerous storm-related crises, including the rescue of as many as 200 people who were left trapped in their cars. Now, here's a novel award from the RSGB, aimed at younger members and non-members alike. This could be a great way for individuals or groups, such as scouts or cadets, to really get their practical thinking caps on. The Radio Society of Great Britain has announced its new Radio Surfer Award, aimed at young people but open to everyone, regardless of age, and there's no need to be an RSGB member. The idea is to pick challenges from a list and gain sufficient points to match your age. Amongst the challenges are get a message from space, that could be via satellite, Earth, Moon, Earth, or the International Space Station, make a stealth HF antenna that can't be seen from 50 meters away, disprove Ohm's law, and design a simple transceiver. You can find out more about the Radio Surfer Award at rsgb.org. Just head for the Youth Awards section. Dayton Hamvention has announced its 2021 award winners. Hamvention Awards Committee co-chairs Michael Coulter, W8CI, and Frank Before, WS8B, said that despite the pandemic, the Hamvention Committee elected to go forward in announcing its selection of outstanding radio amateurs and predicted that Hamvention will return in 2022. The Amateur of the Year Award went to Angel M. Vasquez Jr., WP3R, the head of Telescope Operations and Puerto Rico Coordination Zone Spectrum Manager for Puerto Rico's famous Arecibo Observatory, was cited as Amateur of the Year for his unswerving and diligent support of amateur radio throughout the entire territory of Puerto Rico and worldwide. Although he was born in Puerto Rico, Vasquez grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and returned to Puerto Rico after college in 1977, taking a job at the Arecibo Observatory. Vasquez earned his amateur radio license in 1993 and headed the 2010 Moon Bounce effort from the observatory, as well as multiple special events using the KP4AO club call sign. He enjoys contesting and DXing. Vasquez helped to provide communication support in the wake of Hurricane Maria. He was named Amateur of the Year in Puerto Rico in 2018 and received the YASMI Excellence Award in 2019. He's also a volunteer examiner and inaugurated the first virtual online bilingual testing program as part of the Greater Los Angeles Amateur Radio Group VEC. The 2021 Technical Achievement Award went to Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, well known as the Space Weather Woman. Calling her a real space pioneer, the awards committee said those who have seen her space weather forecasting shows will agree that she is energetic and excited about her work. A credentialed space weather forecaster, Scove's forecasting work is widely known on social media and has been featured in several publications as well as on television. Her weekly space weather video podcasts are frequently featured on QRZ.com platform, and she regularly appears on other amateur radio-related media. Skalv said she specifically got her ham license in 2018 to better understand and serve the needs of the amateur radio community. She has taught at Contest University and delivered presentations for ARRL, 
Dayton Hamvention, and amateur radio clubs around the world. Professionally, Skov is a research scientist for the Aerospace Corporation. She also teaches the art of space weather forecasting to meteorologists at Millersville University and is working with ARRL and HAMSI to create educational materials. The 2021 Special Achievement Award went to Wesley Lamboli, W3WL. He was nominated by his peers for his lifelong high-energy support for the science and art of amateur radio. Not only has he supported youth coaching, membership recruiting, and technical problem assistance, he always does it with a smile and great humor, the awards committee said. Lemboli spent 40 years in the aerospace industry as a technical writer, electrical and systems engineer, and manager. Introduced to amateur radio in 1955, when a friend invited him to field day, Lamboli credits ham radio for much of his success. Many mentors helped me, and I try to pay it forward as best I can, especially for young people, he said. He's also participated in several D-Expeditions and five Southwest Ohio DX Association D-Expedition of the Year plaques adorn his ham shack. The 2021 Club of the Year Awards Committee named the ARRL-affiliated Vienna Wireless Society, K4HTA, in Virginia as the Club of the Year. As always, it is very difficult to choose the Club of the Year as we receive many deserving club nominations from around the world, the awards committee said. The committee shared that the Vienna Wireless Society's 280 members focus on youth education and public service and promote the growth of ham radio. The club is now the largest and most active in the Washington, D.C. area. Our priorities are fostering fun and inclusive environment, building camaraderie, and focusing on the key areas of service, education, and communication, VWS said. We have a mentor program that encourages and provides equipment to new hams. The club offers licensing classes, workshops, and four educational programs a month at its meetings, and these are archived for broader use. Their annual Winterfest is host to the ARRL Virginia Section Convention. The Vienna Wireless Society operates two repeaters in the D.C. area and actively supports public service communications. Germany's Amateur Radio Roundtable has asked communications regulator Brzeznetza, B-N-E-T-Z-A, to introduce online exams. While U.K. and the U.S.A. have had online exams for almost a year, they aren't widely available elsewhere in the world. A translation of the DARC post reads, Due to the ongoing pandemic, which will probably last a while longer, there is an urgent need for online tests. More and more members are getting in touch who have already learned over a long period of time, but still have not been able to take the exam. With these words, the Amateur Radio Roundtable turns to the Federal Network Agency with a current letter. The American Amateur Radio Association, ARRL, and other associations have offered the opportunity to take an online exam for a long time. At the moment, there is even a trend that there are so many German radio amateurs who are now taking the American exam online in Germany instead. Right now, there are also many universities that hold exams online. Why should it not be allowed for amateur radio exams? The RTA continues in its current document. We shouldn't let the chance go by and offer the possibility of an online amateur radio test in Germany as soon as possible, the RTA says in conclusion. The 45th ham radio event in Friedrichshafen, Germany is still a go for June 25th through the 27th, but the Deutscher Amateur Radio Club concedes that the pandemic is making planning exceedingly difficult. The DARC is the event sponsor, while the venue, the Friedrichshafen Fairgrounds, and local authorities have the last word. Planning underway includes appropriate hygienic and physical distancing policies. The DARC say, The unfortunately still ongoing pandemic makes the planning of any in-person event exceedingly difficult. This also applies to the 45th Ham Radio Exhibition, where the German Amateur Radio Society acts only as the event patron, 
whilst the commercial responsibility and ultimate decision for holding the event is with the Friedrichshafen-based exhibition organization. Plans are outgoing, including appropriate hygienic and physical distancing concepts. With all those measures in place, Ham Radio 2021 will obviously be a much smaller and different event than usual. However, the in-person event can only happen with the approval of the local authorities based on the German government's actual pandemic measures and because of the currently very slow progress with vaccinations in Germany and some uncertainty concerning the virus mutations, it is not clear whether and when such approval will be given. Furthermore, foreign visitors may need to comply with quarantine and or negative PCR test rules when entering Germany. The safety, health, and comfort of our international visitors is our utmost priority, and hence we like to advise you to plan your trip to Friedrichshafen, bearing in mind that the in-person event still might get cancelled. In parallel, we are planning a state-of-the-art online conference event with presentations, discussion, forums, virtual meeting places, and vendor information. We very much would like to include our international visitors in the online conference program by providing you with the opportunity to present your organization in a short video and offer information material for download and more. A detailed program of the online event will be published in due time. Meanwhile, organizers of the United Kingdom's National Hamfest also remain somewhat optimistic about their event to be held in September. The director said on the event website, we are closely monitoring the ever-changing health landscape, government guidance, and roadmap steps coming out of lockdown, and are optimistic that we can arrive at a decision in June for this year's event. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You know, it's funny. The clocks these days, it's not as big a deal as it was maybe uh, 10 years ago when, you, when, when everything didn't automatically jump forward. Your computer, your phone. I, uh, maybe I'm unusual, but most of the clocks in my house are those radio control clocks, so they jump forward. It's, uh, you know, the only thing I have to do is go over to the uh, stove and change its clock and, uh, and the microwave. No, yeah, the microwave. I have to change this clock. Even my toaster oven is online these days. The Internet of Things. <laughs> At least there's one benefit to putting every convenience and appliance online. They automatically change the time anyway. Ah. I'm a little nervous about what's going on in the United Kingdom. I don't know. It's a different country. I know if you're living in the U.S., you're going, well, what do you care? Well, the U.K. passed something five years ago now called the Snoopers Charter. Well, I don't think that the, I don't think Parliament called it the Snoopers Charter, but everybody else calls it the Snoopers Charter. The uh, Parliament called it the Investigatory Powers Act. And one of the powers they gave... The police in England and the United Kingdom uh, is the power to essentially surveil everybody's web access all the time. So now they're testing it. Took them a while, but they're testing it. Two unnamed internet service providers, probably one of the big ones, a couple of them, uh, when queried about this by wired.co.uk, said, no comment. That means they're probably the ones, right? And the National Crime Agency. Well, we're all against crime. Nobody likes crime. Law and order, it's a good thing. I'm not against it. But I am against what, what they call fishing expeditions, where they, in effect, it's like gathering the haystack just in case there's a needle in there. Just in case. Then we have the whole haystack. So the, the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, and two ISPs are get Now, you tell me what you think about this. They're collecting... Everything you do online, the, the, they call it the ICRs or Internet Connection Records. The Everything you do online, except for the, what you're doing on that page, but which pages you go to, which pages you search for, all of that is being recorded for everyone who uses those ISPs. Just in case at some point a crime occurs, is committed, and the National Crime Agency needs to, you know, find out what's going on now they have everything right because it's too late once the crime has occurred you can't go back in time and say well what what was what was that person doing 
So they're they're collecting everything. And by the way, the law, the Investigatory Powers Act or Snoopers Charter, says that service providers who are doing this cannot talk about it. We have something like that here in the United States, too, I should mention. But nothing like the Snoopers Charter. The apps you use, the domains you visit, domains, not the actual pages, okay, IP addresses, when you begin to use the internet and when you stop using the internet, and the amount of data that's transferred to and from the device. It's not, you know, I think that the, when they passed it, they said, well, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We're not collecting information about the actual pages you visit or what you do on those pages, just the fact that you visited. But as we, I think a lot of us now know, if, if you collect that, they call it metadata, there's a lot you can tell from metadata. I like the, I like the uh, one uh, privacy advocate said, it's like collecting the whole haystack for a couple of needles. Just get the whole thing, you never know. They're trialing it, they can do it by law. And I suspect, you know, I know this happens. Our Congress looks over the, over the Atlantic and says, well, that worked. Let's try it here. They're doing that already with what happened in Australia. I don't know if you know, the Australians proposed a bill that would essentially tax links. The, the bill was proposed by Rupert Murdoch and uh, big journalist uh, organizations, journal newspapers and so forth in Australia because they said, well, Google... Uh, when they, you know, when you do a search result for a news story, it shows the link to the page, but it also shows a little snippet from the link. And they said they should be paying for that snippet. Okay. <laughs> Google says you should be paying for the search result. <laughs> We're sending you traffic worth a lot more. Nobody's going to read the snippet and say, well, I don't need to read the rest of it. No, they use as you, I mean, think about your own search use. You search for something. The snippets help you know if that's the page you want. And then if it is, you go to that page. Google says we're driving traffic. Eventually, uh, the law forced Google and uh, Facebook to do deals to pay basically the, the big companies for those links. And now U.S. lawmakers are saying, hey, that worked. Let's try it. The Journalism Competition and Preservation Act of 2021 would allow small news outlets to join forces to negotiate as a collective block with online content distributors, Facebook and Google, for favorable terms. Favorable terms. The contention is that without, well, here's what Microsoft's president, Microsoft piling on, by the way. <laughs> Pay no attention to the problems we're having with the exchange servers. Pay no attention to all those hacks. No, no, no. You know, the problem today in America is there's a fundamental lack of competition in search and ad tech markets. It's controlled by Google. By the way, Microsoft is in that market. It's not doing as well. As a result, says Brad Smith, Microsoft president, testifying in front of a Congress this week. As a result, there's a persistent and structural imbalance between a technology gatekeeper and the free press. So go ahead, tax them. Don't tax us. Well, we're fine. But you can tax Google and Facebook. Uh, okay. Google says, Microsoft just is trying to distract you from their the, the horrible hacks. Boy, this was the week, I tell you. The, uh, it's called, Microsoft called it Hafnium, because what they don't want you to do is call it the Exchange Server hack. But that's what it is. Microsoft uh, Exchange Server is widely used by businesses and government to run their email systems. And, oh, what a mess. What a mess. This hack has now spread to hundreds of thousands of organizations. Even, the patch came out, even though Microsoft knew about it a month before they patched it. The patch came out. But unfortunately, people were hacked before the patch came out. It's just pervasive. It's everywhere. And security experts are saying if you're running Exchange email server, which a lot, again, a lot of companies do, assume you've been hacked. Just assume. This is the second one, the second big governmental hack. Remember Solar Winds? Microsoft also involved in that. I'm told I shouldn't use the word hack or hacker. Hackers, some of whom are good people, most of whom are good people. Hackers, originally hackers meant the people who, you know, take computer hardware and software and make it do new things, you know, bang on it, hack on it. The idea came from, you know, you're, you're kind of hacking around like a golfer hacks around, you know, maybe not. Not really with precision, but but you're getting things done. Then it kind of came 
to mean a bad guy. And the folks, there's a whole hacking is not a crime movement. They're asking journalists, if you go to hackingisnotacrime.org, you could see in big letters, hacking is not a crime. They're asking journalists to stop using the term hacker and hacking for evil, vile, menacing exploits. They don't offer a alternative, <laughs> unfortunately. They say it's law-breaking. They're criminals. That's not what hackers are. Hacking's not a crime. It's the ethical endeavor of exploration and problem-solving. I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. Unfortunately, language doesn't really <laughs> lend itself. For a long time, I, you know, I'm a podcaster. I do podcasts. And for a long time, I said, don't call him a podcast. That's an Apple device. Has nothing to do with an iPod. Don't call him. It's netcasting. You're, you, instead of broadcasting, which is what this show is, broadcast, it's a netcast. It's over the internet. Nobody. No, I couldn't convince anybody. I gave in. I said, eh, it's a podcast. Okay, fine. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? SpaceX just rolled out its Falcon 9. It's big old rocket to the launch pad at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. We're going to lift off at uh, 6 01 Eastern tomorrow morning. 60 more Starlink satellites. Starlink is, I hear more and more people saying, Yeah, I signed up for Starlink. Starlink is that idea, crazy though it sounded a, a couple of years ago. It's now sounding a little less crazy. Elon Musk, yeah, you know him from Tesla and. His SpaceX is his space company, his commercial space company, uh, got permission from the Federal Communications Commission to launch up to 12,000 satellites, 12,000 satellites to provide Internet access, high speed Internet access to every corner of the planet. Wow. And they're launching like crazy. I don't know how many uh, they've got up now. I don't you know. The, it's got to be close to a thousand at this point. And they are offering it. Uh, it's not cheap right now. They're offering uh, the Starlink is the name of the Internet service. They're offering Starlink service for you buy the gear. You have to have a special satellite dish to receive it. So it's not cheap. But I'm guessing that the plan is, I would guess, to make it inexpensive in some regions, but uh, make some money off uh, the U.S. In fact, Elon thinks that the money he makes from this Starlink Internet project will fund his plans to colonize Mars. So I guess he thinks it's going to be fairly uh, profitable. The first, they call it tranche of Starlinks, will be 1,581 satellites orbiting about 341 miles above the Earth. It's a pretty low orbit, 53 degrees, tilted 53 degrees to the equator. So I think they must be close to that first tranche. SpaceX says uh, they're taking pre-orders now for people in the southern United States and other lower latitude regions, because that's where the satellites are right now, that should be available by the end of this year. It's pretty expensive, but I know a lot of people. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, lives in a cabin in the woods, loves it. But, of course, you know, you get all the beauty of the cabin in the woods, but you also don't get great Internet service. So he's really hopeful, as many of us are, that this is, uh, is going to bring Internet service everywhere. This is the... A, kind of a big anniversary, actually. The anniversary of uh, of lockdown. Okay, fine. It is, has been one year, I admit. It's also Pi Day, which means everybody go out and have some pie because it's 314, which is a very approximate measurement of pi, the ratio of uh, the circumference of a circle to its radius. Pi R squared, right? But more importantly, this is the 15th anniversary of Amazon Web Services. It was 15 years ago that Amazon announced, hey, <laughs> I know you think we're a bookstore. That's what y'all thought. We were so wrong, weren't we? Jeff Bezos knew better, but uh, we didn't know that at the time. He said, I know you think we're a bookstore, but guess what? In order to be the everything store, we have to have a lot of computers and servers. And we were thinking, maybe we could make those servers, you know, what we've learned in running big network centers and all that, available uh, for rent. At the time, back in uh, March 14th, 2006, at least before that day, 
if you wanted to, and I remember this, my friend uh, Kevin Rose, who was, you know, had this great idea to do a, a news service called Dig. Uh, so if you had a great idea startup, you would have to go out, as Kevin did, find a, a network operations center. Because even, actually, I remember even earlier going over to visit Yahoo when they were first starting out, Jerry Yang and they, they, I went over to Yahoo just to say hi, this new thing, this internet directory. It was just like these offices, Cube Farm and stuff. And he said, uh, Jerry said, you want to go see the, the servers? I said, what? Yeah, they're right over here. And they were in a closet. Yahoo was running out of a closet. Back in the day, that's how, you know, that's how you did it. By the time uh, my friend Kevin started his startup in the early 2000s, you probably didn't run it out of your closet. You ran it out of a network operations center because they had power. They had backup power. They had air conditioning. They were secure. What they didn't have was computers. So Kevin went out, bought a, a server. They called them colos, co-location units. So they brought the server over, configured it, installed the operating system, installed his software, had it up and running, plugged it into the server's uh, internet connection, the server room, and left. It was in a colo. Very expensive, time-consuming. If you wanted to update it, you know, you had to f do it remotely or go over there and open up the cage and put in a disk and that kind of thing. So it really was a lot more expensive and a lot more difficult to start up something. And along comes Amazon 15 years ago today, and they announced Amazon's web services, AWS. Their first product was S3, which was storage, storage in the cloud. By the way, everything runs on Amazon Web Services these days. Netflix, Pinterest, Airbnb, everything. It's all, it's all running on AWS uh, storage. S3 was the first. Later, they added computing, the Elastic Compute Cloud, ECC, and, and more services. There are several hundred now, all of which made it possible for a guy like Kevin Rose, the next Kevin Rose or the next... Uh, Jerry Yang to just say, ah, oh, yeah, I'm gonna, I gotta, I, let me I'm write some code, okay, and I'm gonna spin up a server out there in the cloud, upload it to the cloud. I'm running. I'm on the uh, on the uh, internet. I'm a service. I'm an app. It really changed the world. Fifteen years ago today, the world changed. I think the cloud. I think we could say this is the birthday of the cloud. How about that? On this day in 2006, it really changed the economics of a startup of uh, creating a software as a service or an app. It just, it transformed everything we know. So it's, so there are three anniversaries. Well, two anniversaries and a cuckoo calendar day. Pi Day, happy Pi Day. Did you see, okay, have you, have you been following this cuckoo idea called NFTs, non-fungible tokens? I don't blame you if you haven't, and I don't blame you if you have and can't figure it out because it's bizarre, but there was a big deal this week in non-fungible tokens, there's an artist, he calls himself Beeple. Beeple sold a work of art today. Well, it wasn't exactly a work of art. It was auctioned off at Christie's, the famous art gallery and all of that. But it wasn't the artwork itself that he sold because the artwork itself is digital. It doesn't have a physical form. It's uh, bits on a drive. What he sold was essentially not even a JPEG. He sold... The rights, the ownership to the JPEG as an NFT, as a non-fungible token. I don't know how to explain this to you. You don't have something physical. You can't hold this work of art. You could print it and put it up on the wall, but so could I. Because, I mean, <laughs> it's a JPEG. And it's still, you know, you can go look for, just look for Beeple. <laughs> his uh, his uh, work of art was called Every Day is the First 5,000 Days. It's a collage of all the images he has posted online since he started in 2007. A little bit of an anniversary there, one year after Amazon Web Services, huh? This, why do I mention this? Why do, why should you care, you might say? I don't think I care that much, except Christie's sold it for $69.3 million. It's the third highest auction price achieved for a living artist. Six, well, nine million was fees. Good job, Christie. I bet Christie got that in dollars, not Bitcoin. But uh, the other 60 million was cryptocurrency, Ethereum. I think, uh, for an NFT, which is not the work of art, but just the ownership of that work of art. You could say, I own it because I paid $60 million for it. It's the first purely digital NFT sold by Christie's. It accepted payment in Ethereum. That's the, that's the cryptocurrency most often used for these NFTs. The third highest amount ever paid for a 
work of art by a living artist. And it's, it's not even the work of art. It's just, it's very confusing. And actually, if your first reaction is, that's a scam, you're, you, may be, you may not be far off. The 60 million, we're not sure who bought it. It was, uh, it was bought by a pseud pseudonymous buyer, but it's pretty, we're pretty sure it was actually bought. He uses the, uh, the online name of Metacovan, but we're pretty sure it's, and I'm, and I'm quoting here Amy Castor, who's writing on the, uh, on her blog, that it's a guy named Vignesh Sundras, Sundarasan. Vignesh Sundarasan. He's a crypto entrepreneur, been around for a few years, has built and sold a number of companies, made a lot of money in Ethereum. Uh, a few years ago, he raised $47 million for coins, <laughs> Bitcoin-like things, Ethereum coin. Ethereum's just another Bitcoin. It's believed that he's going to take this $60 million NFT that he bought and sell shares to others. And step three, profit. He's going to make money. One of the reasons this craziness in NFTs, Elon Musk's girlfriend, the alternative musician Grimes, sold $6 million worth of her artworks in 20 minutes. Six million in 20 minutes. That seems like a lot at the time. Now it's nothing. But the reason this money is floating around because it's, it's fake money. It's uh, cryptocurrency. There's a lot of cryptocurrency millionaires and billionaires out there who don't know what to do with their money right now. So... They're uh, buying stuff, I guess. Not even stuff. Not stuff. You can't hang it on your wall. You can't take it home with you. Metacovan didn't sit there at the Christie's Gallery and say, okay, wrap it up. I'll take it home. No. I don't think he was even there. It was all done digitally. What a world we live in. I could go in greater depth explaining what this these non-fungible tokens are, what they mean. But you know what? It's not worth it. Just note, this week, a JPEG sold for $60 million in cryptocurrency. Thank you very much. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In 1974, the amateur radio population was on the increase again, thanks to the popularity of 2-meter FM. Incentive licensing had been in place for five years, and the anger and resentment over losing HF frequencies was beginning to fade. However, trouble was brewing. The FCC had several petitions on their agenda, mostly from hams, and one from the Electronics Industry Association. In late 1974, two bombshells were dropped. The first surprise was docket number 20282, the FCC's restructuring plan for amateur radio. Apparently oblivious to the upheaval that was caused in the 1960s with incentive licensing, the FCC was now proposing rules that would take away major privileges from generals, eliminate the ability of 90% of technicians to renew their license, and horror of horrors, create a new no-code license. The proposal was somewhat complicated, so grab a pencil and some paper and follow along. The FCC, in essence, wanted to create a dual ladder incentive licensing system with two routes available. The first, named Series A, covered the shortwave frequencies, while Series B encompassed the VHF UHF allocations. The dividing line between Series A and Series B was not 50 megahertz as one would expect, but rather 29 megahertz, or roughly in the middle of the 10 meter band. Series A contained the familiar amateur classes, novice, general, advanced, and extra. Novices would get a power increase from 75 to 250 watts input, and would also gain a five-year renewable license to replace the two-year non-renewable one now in existence. Generals would lose big. They would lose the 29.0 to 29.7 megahertz segment of 10 meters. They would be limited to A1, CW, A3, AM and sideband, and F3, FM emissions only. In other words, no more slow scan TV, RIDI, or radio control. Power output would be reduced to 500 watts PEP, and they could no longer supervise mail examinations. 
Furthermore, they could no longer be the trustee of a club station or repeater. Generals who were already licensed if or when this proposal was adopted would be grandfathered into the Series B technician class license. The advanced class gained under Series A. They kept all of their privileges below 29 megahertz, received a power increase to two kilowatts PEP output, gained access to the extra class phone segments, and would be grandfathered into the new experimenter class in Series B. The extra class lost their exclusive phone bands, which would be shared with the advanced license. However, they kept their CW subbands and gained the two kilowatt PEP output as well as a lifetime operator license. Notice that the conditional class license is not mentioned. That's because the FCC incorporated into the general license. Conditionals would have the letter C after the word general and their license would not be renewable. On the Series B or VHF UHF side, the proposed changes were even more drastic. The FCC for the entry level license would create a new no code communicator class which would allow operations above 144 megahertz using F3 FM emissions only. Technicians would gain some frequencies, the 50.0 to 50.1 and 144 through 145 megahertz segments, but otherwise like generals would lose big. They could only use A1, A3 and F3 emissions with 500 watts PEP output and could not be the trustee of a club station or repeater. However, the worst news for technician was that those who had taken their exam via mail, or about 90%, would not be allowed to renew. They, like the conditionals, would have to pass the test again before their license expired. One step above the technician class was another new license proposed by the FCC, the experimenter class. Experimenters would have all amateur privileges above 29 megahertz with a two kilowatt PEP output. Above the experimental license was the extra class, which held the distinction of being the top of the ladder for both series A and series B. The FCC proposed adjusting the written exams to accommodate the different requirements of series A and series B. Element two, the old novice written exam, would be rewritten into 2A for novice and 2B for communicator. Novices would have to pass the five words per minute code as well as 2A, while communicators only had to pass 2B. Likewise, the general element 3 would be divided into 3A general and 3B technician. Generals and technicians would still have to pass the 13 and five words per minute code test respectively. Advanced class operators needed 13 words per minute and the element 4A written exam, while experimenters had to pass a five words per minute code test along with element 4B. For the advanced and experimenter classes, only the 20 words per minute code test was needed to upgrade to extra. Since, except for the extra, the Series A and Series B licenses did not overlap, the FCC would allow amateurs to hold one license in each series. This created some interesting possibilities. As previously noted, a general could also hold a technician and an advanced, the experimenter. Both the technicians and experimenters could obtain a novice if they passed element 2A. The no-code communicator could also hold a novice if element 2A and the five words per minute code test was passed. The FCC set a June 1975 deadline for comments on the restructuring proposal. The ARRL, still smarting from incentive licensing conflicts, wasn't going to comment until they had taken the pulse of their members. What was the ARRL's response? And just what was the Class ECB, the other FCC proposal? How did it affect amateur radio? In our next installment, the Ancient Amateur Archives will have the answers. Voting has begun for the Radio Society of Great Britain's elections. Here with more details on the election process this year is Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from Southgate Amateur Radio News. Voting in the Radio Society of Great Britain elections is now open. The calling notice, resolutions, candidate statements and the voting process can all be found on the Society's AGM web pages, rsgb.org forward slash AGM. Voting ends at 9am on Thursday the 22nd of April. The RSGB will be holding its AGM online this year on Saturday the 24th of April and will live stream the event. 
RSGB members can submit written AGM questions for board directors in advance via a special form on the AGM web pages. The election details are also available in the April Radcom magazine, which RSGB members will be receiving this week. The Society is also preparing for its annual general meeting, which will be held online and will be available on live stream on Saturday, the 24th of April. If members have questions for any of the directors, they will be able to submit them in advance using the form available on the Society's website at rsgb.org. Meanwhile, Hams in Australia will be pleased to learn that the Australian Maritime College has indicated system changes are in the works to enable them to issue two-by-one contest call signs. The changes, however, are expected to take several months. Sixty additional Internet satellites were added to the Starlink fleet after a March 11th launch from Florida's Kennedy Space Center. The satellites, however, weren't the only things of interest on board. A number of radio enthusiasts have been reporting on Reddit.com, Hackaday, and similar websites that they were able to receive the Falcon 9 spacecraft's telemetry downlink on 2232.5 MHz. Some of the innovators reported that they were able to demodulate the signal, convert it into binary data, and then plain text. Two hackers, in particular, were reported to have received the transmissions using a repurposed satellite dish and an open-source SDR peripheral known as a Hacker RF. Of course, while they were all listening and decoding, most of the rest of us were simply waiting to learn that in the skies just 180 miles south of New Zealand, 60 newcomers now raised the total of the Starlink fleet to total 1,265 satellites. In advance of the World Radio Communication Conference 23, the amateur radio allocation at 1240 to 1300 MHz, the 23cm band, remains in the spotlight in International Telecommunication Union Region 1, which is Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Chair of International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Spectrum Affairs, Barry Lewis, G4SJH reported that preparatory work continued during the February 15th through 19th meeting of ITRU Working Party 4C. Also representing the IARU was Ole Garpestad, LA2RR, with other IARU members present within national delegations from Australia, Brazil, Canada, and the U.S. The 23 centimeter WRC agenda item has initiated technical studies focused on coexistence between the amateur services and the Galileo GPS radio navigation satellite service. The IARU participated in the meeting and delivered key information on amateur activities in this microwave band. This information is vital to ensure that the amateur services are realistically representative in the studies as they move forward. Lewis said that it remains vital to the national amateur communities to present their views on the importance of this band to their national regulators in, in a consistent manner. To assist, IARU Region 1 is developing supporting material that member associates can refer to when addressing that topic with national regulators. Work on the topic will continue throughout the year and beyond, both in ITRU and in the regional telecom organizations. The summary meeting report for the Working Party 4C meeting says that only administration that can be considered supportive to the proper treatment of the amateur services in the work is Germany. It encouraged support from outside Europe. Working Party 4C will meet again uh, in July. The WWVB broadcast system is being upgraded with new equipment to improve the reliability of the signal. In order to install this equipment, beginning on March 9, 2021, the WWVB signal may be operated on a single antenna at approximately 30 kilowatts radiated power for periods up to several days in duration and may have occasional outages. Periods of reduced power operation lasting longer than 30 minutes will be logged on the WWVB antenna configuration and power web page and any outage longer than five minutes duration will be recorded on the WWVB outage web page. The upgrades are expected to be complete by April 9, 2021. 
WWVB is located on the same site as NIST HF radio station WWV near Fort Collins, Colorado. The WWVB broadcasts are used by millions of people throughout North America to synchronize consumer electronic products like wall clocks, clock radios, and wristwatches. In addition, WWVB may be used in other consumer timekeeping applications such as appliances, cameras, and irrigation controllers, as well as in high-level applications such as highly accurate time synchronization. WWV continuously broadcasts digital time codes on a 60 kHz carrier that may serve as a stable frequency reference traceable to the national standard at NIST. The time codes are synchronized with the 60 kHz carrier and are broadcast continuously in two different formats at a rate of one bit per second using pulse width modulation as well as phase modulation. WWVB uses two identical antennas that were originally constructed in 1962 and refurbished in 1999. The north antenna was originally built for WWVL 20 kHz broadcast, which was discontinued in 1972, and the south antenna was built for the WWVB 60 kHz broadcast. The antennas are spaced 857 meters apart. Each antenna is a top-loaded monopole consisting of four 122-meter towers arranged in a diamond shape. A system of cables, often called a capacitance hat or top hat, is suspended between the four towers. The top hat is electrically isolated from the towers and is electrically connected to a downlead suspended from the center of the top hat. The downlead serves as the radiating element. There are three transmitters at the WWVB site. Two are in constant operation and one serves as its standby transmitter that is activated if one of the primary transmitters fail. Using two transmitters and two antennas allows the station to be more efficient. As mentioned earlier, the WWVB antennas are physically much smaller than one quarter wavelength. As the length of a vertical radiator becomes shorter compared to wavelength, the efficiency of the antenna goes down. In other words, it requires more and more transmitter power to increase the efficiency radiated power. The north antenna system at WWVB has an efficiency of about 56.3% and the south antenna has an efficiency of about 54%. However, the combined efficiency of the two antennas is about 68.8%. As a result, each transmitter has to produce a forward power of about 51 kilowatts to produce an effective radiated power of 70 kilowatts. Here is the current list of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Visit the ARRL Learning Network to register, check on upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions. Please remember that the ARRL Learning Network webinars are a members-only benefit. The Art and Science of Operating Ultra Portable, hosted by Mike Molina, KN6 EZE. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, April 6, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 0 UTC, on Wednesday, April 7th. Ultraportable operation is quickly growing in popularity, whether for SOTA, POTA, backcountry survival, or just spending time in nature. Learning how to operate Ultraportable is a fun and rewarding experience. In this presentation, Mike, KN6, EZE, covers the basics for new and experienced ham radio operators. Finding and Fixing RFI, hosted by Paul Cianciello, W1VLF. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, April 20th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. RFI, or radio frequency interference, from natural and man-made sources has been a problem for hams and shortwave listeners since the radio hobby began. Things have changed in the last 20 years with the advent of widespread solar power, LED lighting, grow lights, and computers. The technology boom has enhanced our daily lives, but at what price? Learn all about finding and fixing RFI in today's world. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, 
W7VO. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, April 22nd, 2021 at 3 p.m. Eastern or 1930 UTC. An educational seminar to help new and experienced amateurs who are on HF and finding themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, talk about the various noise sources, and discuss how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is, as always, subject to change. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Saturday, March 20th, 2021. Tad Cook, K7R A in Seattle, our propagation forecaster, reports that average daily sunspot numbers this week rose just a little from 18.4 to 19, and average daily solar flux edged up from 78.9 to 79.1. Solar activity, however, remains low. The vernal equinox, the first day of spring in the northern hemisphere, occurred at 0937 UTC on Saturday, March 20th. That's when the southern and northern hemispheres will be bathed in approximately equal amounts of solar radiation, which has a positive effect on HF propagation. On March 17th and 18th, the daily sunspot number was only 12 on both days, but the total sunspot area rose from 50 to 200 microhemispheres. Sunspot area was last at this level on February 25th. The Space Weather Prediction Center offers daily statistics and daily sunspot area, sunspot numbers, and solar flux, if you're interested. Average daily planetary A indices rose from 7.6 to 10.3, and average daily middle latitude A indices increased from 6.1 to 7.3. Solar wind on March 14th drove the planetary A index to 25, and the Alaska College A index was 37. On Wednesday, March 17th, spaceweather.com warned that minor geomagnetic unrest was expected on March 18th due to a co-rotating interactive region that would disturb our magnetic field. Co-rotating interactive regions are transition zones between fast and slow-moving solar wind streams. Plasma piles up in these regions, creating shock-like density gradients that often do a good job sparking auroras, spaceweather said. Also on March 18th, spaceweather.com reported that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration forecasters said that a minor G1-class geomagnetic storm is likely on March 20th and 21st when a stream of high-speed solar wind hits Earth's magnetic field. The gaseous material is flowing faster than 600 kilometers per second from a southern hole in the sun's atmosphere. Here are the latest forecast numbers from the U.S. Air Force Space Weather Squadron predicts solar flux at 72 on March 19th to the 21st, 70 on March 22nd to the 26th, 76 on March 27th, 75 on March 28th all the way to April 1st, and 78 on April 2nd and 3rd, and 70, 74, 76, and 72 on March 4th to the 7th. The U.S. Space Weather Forecast Squadron predicts the planetary A indice will be 24, 20, 15, 12, and 8, and 10 on March 20th to the 25th. It'll be 5 on March 26th and 27th, 25 on March 28th, drop back to 20 on March 29th and 30th. It'll be 10, 5, 15, and 8 on March 31st to April 3rd, and it will rise to 5 on April 4th to the 7th. Foundations of Amateur Radio Amateur Radio is an environment for infinite possibilities. I've spoken about the way that contacts can happen, seemingly out of the blue, how propagation has so many variables it's hard to predict what will happen at any given moment. During a contest you might scan up and down the bands looking for an elusive multiplier, a contact that's worth extra points, or a missing DXCC country in your quest to contact a hundred or more. It's easy to get swept away in the excitement and disappointment that comes with success and failure. I'm mentioning this because it's pretty much how many people in our community go about their hobby, me included. I've likened making a contact to fishing, taking your time to get the rhythm of the other station, understanding that there's a human at the other end, taking stock of what they're hearing, which stations they're responding to, how they respond, and if they give out hints about making a successful contact with them. 
The other day I came across a request to decode some Morse on an image, showing long and short lines joined together in some form to serve an artistic purpose. Others pointed out that this wasn't Morse. I took an extra moment to point out that Morse had four individual attributes. It has a dit, a da, a spacing between the letters, and a spacing between the words, and since this image didn't have that, it couldn't be Morse code. A few days later it occurred to me that I hadn't been paying attention. Morse actually has five attributes. It also has a spacing between each tone. I updated my answer and began to think about this interaction. It's not the first time that I've stopped to consider what's happening. For example, if I change bands on FTA to digital mode that is very helpful for determining current propagation, I have a look at the level of activity. I'm generally not in a hurry, so I tend to leave it on the same band for a while, sometimes an hour, sometimes less, sometimes more. If the band is in full flight with every slot filled, it's easy to tick the CQ only box and hide all the noise, or rather, extra messages that form the exchange, but sometimes that noise has a whole lot of interesting information. You can determine if one of the stations calling CQ is actually answering anyone, or if they're just an alligator, all mouth, no ears. You can see individual people attempting to get each other's attention, making a local or a long distance contact. You can type in an interesting grid locator that accompanies most CQ calls and see just how far it is from you and in which direction. I will also point out that using FTA to observe a so-called dead band can be just as illustrative. It allows you to see signals in the waterfall. It decodes things that are barely visible, and will give you a feel for how your station at that location on that band at that time is performing in real time. For example, it showed me that the squelch on my radio was turned on and blocking any chance of receiving weak signals, something that I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't taken the time to observe. Another example, during a contest I often take some time to listen to a pile-up that surrounds a massive station to see what stations I can hear, who is coming in strong and who is coming in weak. I keep a mental or actual note of what cracks the S-meter with an indication of signal strength and what only turns up as audio, perfectly readable but not exciting the needle in any way. I might not speak with any of those stations, but I know that there are stations in a particular location that I can hear. It's easy to get swept up in all this massive excitement that is our hobby, but sometimes it pays off to take a breath, to wait a moment, to take a look and have a listen to learn the lay of the land, and understand what is happening, and consider the implications. With that moment of calm you might find an unexpected jewel in the rough. That's, for example, how I managed a contact with South Sudan several years ago during a massive pile-up in a club station during a contest. I'd love to hear what you have stumbled upon serendipitously like that. You can always get in touch. CQ at vk6flab.com is my address. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Time now for the AMSAT report. Ham satellites that have gone dark sometimes have a knack for resurrecting themselves. Remember AO7? Well, it's happened again. The Delphi N3XT is back to life after a seven-year hiatus. On February 9th, an automatic email notification was received from the satellite's ground station, indicating that a signal had been heard from the Delphi satellite. That capability was programmed into the system, so it was a big surprise to all concerned. Now that Delphi N3XT is transmitting again, steps are being taken to further its mission. Mission. Launched in 2013, the satellite operated successfully for three months. Contact with the satellite was lost in late 2014 after an experiment with the amateur radio linear transponder. The big question now is what may have failed and what is now working to allow the satellite to transmit. More research needs to be done to sort this all out. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Since January, radio amateurs throughout India have been celebrating the 100th year since the first ham radio license was issued in that nation. 
It has been a busy year as well for Nikantha Chatterjee VU3ZHA and Amrita Bose Chatterjee VU3VCV who have been involved in training throughout India through a group known as Oscar Open Source Classes for Amateur Radio. Nilkantha wrote in an email that Oscar has been providing online webinars, homebrew sessions, coaching institutes for YLs, and, when possible, antenna building workshops, also with a special emphasis on teaching YLs. Oscar, which is part of the Smart Future Foundation initiative, also has its own smartphone app in English, downloadable from Google Play. In addition, Nilkantha has been operating with a special call sign AT2YAR marking the 100-year celebration. India's first licensed amateur was Amarenda Chandra Guptu, who had the call sign 2JK 100 years ago. He was followed later that same year by McCall Bose with the call sign 2HQ. By the 1930s, India still had only 50 licensed operators, a number that grew to 1,500 by 1980. Much later, India's former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi was not only a supporter of amateur radio, but a licensed operator himself with the call sign VU2RG. India launched its first amateur radio satellite, the HamSat, in 2005. There are now more than 45,000 licensed TAMs in India as it moves into its second century on the air. France's National Frequency Agency, the ANFR, has taken action against a radio amateur who allegedly used threatening language on the air. In a report, ANFR said that at the end of 2020, they joined forces with the gendarmerie to stop an amateur radio operator who was uttering insults and threats on the airwaves. It all started with complaints from the amateur radio community to the ANFR about inappropriate behaviour on the airwaves, punctuated by offensive remarks and death threats. Numerous letters and emails were sent to the ANFR to complain about the particularly inappropriate remarks of an individual. The ANFR decided that it was necessary to put an end to the actions of this individual, whom they referred to as Muska X. The first action was to gather actual evidence of these excessive and insulting remarks. Monitoring HF frequencies through the use of the ANFR radio station located at their International Control Center near Rambouillet, agents were able to confirm these offensive transmissions. Then, investigating further, the ANFR agents discovered that Monsieur X had failed to declare his radio installation to them. This lack of declaration constitutes an infringement of the Electronic Postal and Communications Code, which may be punishable by six months' imprisonment and a fine of €30,000. This oversight immediately provided a legal basis which made it possible to seize Monsieur X's radio equipment without further delay. His location was quickly found, thanks to the database of amateur radio call signs maintained by the ANFR. A local survey confirmed the existence of an amateur service installation, with photos of the external antennas to support this. The ANFR then requested the support of the Gendarmerie Brigade in the area where Monsieur X resided. A site visit was planned. At the request of the Gendarmerie, the ANFR took part in the operation in order to identify the incriminating equipment. So, one day in December 2020, at 6am, the raid was launched. The premises was soon secured. ANFR experts entered the scene to examine radio equipment and carry out some measurements and checks. The equipment Monsieur X had been using was quickly identified and immediately placed under seal. Monsieur X was taken into custody. The next morning, he was presented before the public prosecutor, who notified him of his upcoming summons before the criminal court. In the meantime, he had been placed under judicial supervision. The cooperation between the ANFR and the Gendarmerie has shown its effectiveness in putting an end to these violations of the regulations. This collaboration made it possible to combine expertise and investigative powers for the benefit of the protection of the radio frequency spectrum, with the help of the entire community of radio amateurs. Amateur radio makes it possible to experiment and communicate by radio by making multiple contacts on the frequency bands, either as primary users or shared with other users of the spectrum.
To enable this activity, the radio amateur must obtain a license which recognizes their competence and a call sign which identifies them as an authorized user of frequencies. The use of radio installations by the amateur radio service must comply with the regulatory conditions. Violations of the regulations relating to the amateur service can result in fines, jail terms or administrative sanctions, withdrawal or suspension of the amateur radio call sign. And of course, compliance with these administrative rules does not exempt the radio amateur from respecting human rights, starting with those of their fellow radio amateurs. In this case, it appears ANFR seized the equipment not for what was said on the air, but for a technicality involving EMF compliance. The French license requires amateurs to register with ANFR if they have a station that is capable of running more than 5 watts ERP. It appears such a trivial task to declare it. You just log on to the ANFR website and register your station as being capable of running more than 5 watts ERP. That's all there is to it. No further details are required. In this case, the amateur had neglected to carry out this simple task, and it was for that that the ANFR seized the equipment, not for his alleged actions on the air. Here's a ham radio service you don't often hear about. The Chattanooga Times Free Press newspaper in Tennessee reports that in the wake of the deaths of two radio amateurs, the Lone Ranger Net was established to check each evening that members were okay. The system of nightly radio checks gives affected hams a way to signal if they need help. The Net meets every evening at 7 p.m. local, seven days a week. Jim Gifford, KM4MPF, a 44-year-old Chattanooga businessman, said the Lone Ranger Net was established after one elderly radio operator died of natural causes and another died at his home due to an accident. In both cases, their deaths were not immediately known to friends and family members, he told the newspaper. Now, if someone in the Lone Ranger Net fails to check in on any given night, they get a text, a phone call, or even a knock on the door to make sure all is okay, Gifford said. Next week, don't forget to get on the air between March 24th and March 30th as the amateur radio community says thanks and goodbye to American TV's popular Last Man Standing show, which put amateur radio back in prime time. The main character, like Mike Baxter, KA0XTT, the show is ending its nine-year run. Be listening for the special event station KA6LMS as operators coast to coast in the U.S. and Canada call QRZ. If you're near your radio anywhere in the world, be listening on sh shortwave sideband CW, FT8, D-Star, DMR, YSF, Satellite, Echo Link, All Star, and more. For details, visit the website gsbarc.org/ms. A new Great Lakes WinLink net has been started to promote the use of WinLink and training on the various facets of the hybrid amateur radio data internet system. The net is open primarily to those states that border any of the Great Lakes – Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, and the Canadian province of Ontario. However, radio amateurs wishing to check in from other states or provinces anywhere are welcomed to participate. This net is modeled on the Wisconsin Aries WinLink net. The net check-in process is as follows. Send either a basic plain text message or use any of the form's templates on the WinLink Express platform available that will allow you to include the following line of text in the body of the message or in an appropriate part of the form you choose to send. First name, call sign, city, county, state, and country. The net started on Wednesday, March 10th, and each week on Wednesdays, amateurs may send their messages or forms anytime during the day using WinLink in any mode available, RF or via Telnet. Send your message to KB8RCR, as the recipient on WinLink. After seven years of silence, the Delphi N3XT satellite is again transmitting a signal. The 3U Delphi N3XT nanosat, launched by the Delft University of Technology, has not been heard since 2014, and its sponsors were surprised to learn that it was transmitting again. Delphi N3XT carries a linear amateur radio transponder. 
It was the second satellite launched by TU Delft as part of the Delphi program, which develops very small satellites. The first Delphi satellite, Delphi C3, is still working as well. Now that Delphi N3XT is transmitting again, steps are being taken to further its mission. The Delphi N3XT project started in 2007, and the satellite was launched in November 2013. The satellite operated successfully for three months, achieving mission success. Contact with the satellite was lost in late 2014 after an experiment with the linear transponder. When functioning properly, the satellite transmits telemetry on 145.870 MHz and 145.93 MHz and high-speed data on 2405 MHz. The inverting SSBCW transponder has an uplink passband of 435.530 to 435.570 MHz lower sideband and a downlink passband of 145.880 to 145.920 MHz upper sideband. The ham transponder was a last-minute addition to the project. On February 9th, an automatic email notification was received from the satellite's ground station, indicating that a signal from the Delphi N3XD had been picked up. Student and ground station operator Nils von Storch said he'd programmed the ground station software so that it would continue to track the satellite and notify him if it ever came back to life. Relevant checks and analysis of telemetry frames prove the satellite is transmitting again. The reason it stopped transmitting has not yet been determined. And the big question now is how it was able to resume operation. Hypotheses include a flip bit in the software or a short circuit given the extreme conditions in space. Of course, in the past we have looked for all kinds of explanations. We also had theories about how the contact could never come back. Nano Satellite Program Manager Jasper Baumeister, PC4JB, said, but after so long, I hadn't counted on it anymore. Baumeister, who has been managing the mission since 2007, expressed confidence that the satellite can still be of use to science. But I am sure that we will be able to find solutions, operations manager Stefano Speretta said. If we don't lose the signal again, there are interesting times ahead. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. When climbing on a commercial tower, we need to be aware of RF safety laws. Exposure has been the subject of debate lately, especially since the guidelines have been introduced into the amateur's vocabulary. There are certain requirements you need to be aware of. Some are required by law, and some are not. This all depends on the tower and how it is loaded with commercial services. For those of you who are not aware of the federally mandated safety guidelines, there's a general set of rules about working safely with sources of energy. Lockout, tagout is a phrase which refers to the use of safety devices to help prevent accidental injury to workers servicing equipment. On towers, lockout, tagout can include seals on breaker switches, inline coax switches, or other similar devices. I'm not going to refer to any specifics but to good personal safety guidelines. If you are working on a shorter tower with perhaps a few paging systems, you need to consider exposure to RF as well as the risk of injury from contact with active antennas. When you are working on or near an antenna or its feed line, you must ensure that it is difficult or impossible for someone to turn on the transmitter while you are on the tower. If you are at 250 feet and your partner is on the ground, another person working in the transmitter shack could easily turn on the transmitter that is attached to your body. It is your responsibility to unplug the transmitter's power cord or remove the fuses, mark or lock the breaker so anyone else not involved in your work cannot accidentally turn on the injury-causing transmitter. Before you start working, make sure everyone in the area is aware of what should or should not be turned on and install some sort of locking device. A cable tie is suitable as a lockout in many circumstances. I sometimes put 
cable ties through the holes in the prongs of a 115 volt plug to prevent it from being plugged in while I'm on the tower. If I'm working on a hard wired system, I may remove the coax and cable tie it to something inside the cabinet along with something like my car keys to prevent me from forgetting to reconnect the coax as well as preventing it from getting turned on and cooking my fingers off. When working on a crowded tower, you may have to arrange to climb at pre-scheduled off-air times to minimize exposure to powerful RF fields. I will not climb near an active broadcast antenna and prefer to climb near active paging system antennas during off-peak times. This is another reason why I prefer to climb at night. The essence of lockout tagout is to ensure that the system you're working on is at or very close to a zero potential energy state. Equally important is that the energy supply to the device is locked in a zero energy state by any reasonable means which would prevent a casual user from activating the device while you are working on it. Some simple methods of locking out a transmitter would include shutting off a breaker and locking it in the off position, removing fuses and locking the fuse box shut, switching off a breaker and using a hardware store breaker lock and tag to mark it out of service. For the home-based amateur, shutting off the power to the radios connected to the tower is a good beginning. Unplugging power cords or unhooking coax wires is another. Here's another good reason to have a ground crew. They can also become involved in lockout tagout. Just remember to lower each device to a zero energy state before starting the climb. Sometimes this is not possible, but always plan for the safest climb. After doing it several times, it'll become second nature to you. There's a lot more on lockout tagout than I have time to cover here. So if you're climbing for a living, be sure to review your employer's safety and exposure guidelines. Another place to look for information is the OSHA webpage or your state's electrical safety codes. Remember, you cannot tell if an antenna is transmitting just by looking at it. Direct contact with a transmitting antenna can leave you with an instantaneous and very painful burn. Getting a second degree burn on the palm of your hand at 150 feet on a tower would ruin anyone's day. Also keep in mind that just because a transmitter is unplugged, it may still offer a small voltage difference between the tower and that antenna. It is impossible to attain the exact same ground potential between all the systems on a tower. So the risk of a shock while climbing will always be present. Just be careful when you touch antennas on towers. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Northern Hemisphere spring is less than a week away. That means hot ribbons of plasma are starting to flow in Earth's magnetosphere. High latitude sky watchers are seeing this purple phenomenon called Steve from their backyards right now. Steve is short for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. It was long thought to be a type of aurora borealis, but it's not. Auroras appear when particles rain down from space. Steve, on the other hand, doesn't require rain. Instead, satellite measurements show that it is a ribbon of hot gas at 3000 degrees Celsius, speeding through the upper reaches of Earth's magnetic field faster than 10,000 miles per hour. The ribbon's purple hue is still a mystery. Some research suggests the colour comes from heated nitrogen, but the jury is still out. You can see photos of the phenomenon in the full article over at spaceweather.com. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Youth Working Group has said no youth events will take place before mid-June and that it will review those scheduled for later in the year as the pandemic situation evolves. The group said these events make social distancing difficult, and it doesn't believe it would be possible for them to take place safely. Other 2021 events will remain on the calendar for the time being. The position on the pandemic remains serious and unpredictable, the group said. Governments everywhere struggle with balancing the health of their economies 
with the health of their populations. The vaccine rollout seems likely to take most of this year, and even then, the impact of mutant strains of the virus and national quarantine requirements are difficult to predict. IARU Region 1 has planned several in-person events for 2021 in the Youth Amateur Radio Direction Finding and High Speed Telegraphy Competition areas. A workshop for member societies is also on the calendar. Whether these will take place as scheduled remains up in the air. IARU Region 1 has said it will review the forecast evolution of the pandemic sufficiently before each event to decide whether it will take place. Generally, this will be four months prior to the scheduled date, the IARU said. That way, those planning to attend should have sufficient time to make the necessary travel arrangements. IARU Region 1 said it wants to make sure that any events taking place do so in an environment that respects national requirements for pandemic control and does not place the health and well-being of participants at risk. Millions of homes across the UK are set to be upgraded to faster, more reliable broadband under new regulations announced today by Ofcom that will help shape the country's full fibre future. As demand for data continues to accelerate, the UK's infrastructure urgently needs an upgrade. This will require significant private investment in full fibre broadband, which is much faster and more reliable than the networks most people use today. Network competition has helped full fibre coverage increase at its fastest ever rate over the last year. The new Ofcom regulations are designed to build on this momentum, driving competitive commercial investment in fibre and supporting the closure of the country's 100-year-old copper network, while ensuring consumers are protected from high prices. Ofcom say that their decisions to support competitive investment include action on the following key areas. Wholesale price regulation that encourages investment and promotes competition. Closing the copper network duct and pole access, and preventing anti-competitive behaviour. Ofcom have also set out how they will regulate open reaches leased lines, high-speed connections used by large organisations which also form the data highways of the UK's mobile and broadband networks. The new regulations will apply to British Telecom from April 2021 until March 2026. Under the new regulations, Ofcom have prohibited geographic pricing for some services to address the concern that Openreach could use targeted discounts to undermine new alternative network build. And Ofcom has also announced the outcome of the principal stage of its auction to release more airwaves to improve mobile services and support 5G. A total of 200 MHz of spectrum was available to bid for in the auction. Well, just as one example, the mobile operator EE Limited has won two 10 MHz segments of paired frequency spectrum in the 700 MHz band at a cost of £280 million. Also, 20 MHz of supplementary downlink spectrum in the 700 MHz band at a cost of £4 million. And a 40 MHz segment in the 3.6 to 3.8 GHz band at a cost of £168 million. Most of the big players had sought additional spectrum, meaning that the total revenue raised from the principal stage was £1,356,400,000, with all the money to be paid into Her Majesty's Treasury. Well, the auction will now move to the assignment stage. This process involves a single bidding round in which the companies can bid for the frequency positions they prefer for the airwaves they've secured in the principal stage. You can read more about this in the Ofcom media release at ofcom.org.uk. In Germany, a device marketed for its alleged healing powers has been banned for interfering with amateur radio communications. Marketers selling an electronic device claimed that for the steep price of 8,000 euros, the equivalent of more than 9,000 US dollars, it could awaken the healing powers of the human body by revitalizing its water content. Apparently, what it really awakened was amateur radio interference. A recent news report by the Associated Press said that the device being sold by the Swiss company Vossermatrix AG uses frequencies allocated for amateur radio operators. According to the DARC website, 
RFI has been reported by HAMS using the low end of 2 meters in the weak signal and EME segment. A posting on the QRZ.com forum cited claims made by the device's developers that operation was based on principles used by Nikola Tesla and George Lakovsky, claiming that it was especially effective because the human body is comprised of a high percentage of water. The RFI complaints are what set the regulator's actions in motion. The device's sale and use are now banned in Germany. Use of already purchased units would be a prosecutable offense. The 2021 Calm Academy is two days of training, talks, and information on emergency communications. This year's theme is disasters here, there, and everywhere. Are we ready? Calm Academy is the emergency communications and amateur radio conference to be held between April 10th and the 11th. Registration is completely free, and you must register to gain access to the complete schedule and academy material. It's entirely virtual and hosted online. Headquartered in Seattle, Washington, Com Academy is attended and supported by organizations including ARIES, Auxiliary Communications Service, EOC Support Teams, RACES, Civil Air Patrol, Coast Guard Auxiliary, REACT and CERT among others. All interested in emergency and amateur radio communications are welcome to learn, network, and share your experience with others. The Com Academy Steering Committee says that the annual event has continued to evolve by presenting keynotes and seminar tracks that engage beginner, intermediate, and advanced users in technologies, served agency support, volunteer management, self-preparedness, and how volunteer and professional communications are used, adapted, and improved. The leadership has reviewed how it can preserve the direction and focus of the event while restricted by the pandemic. The event is always focused on education for communications leaders, volunteers, and professionals. And now, with our final story for this week from Southgate Vibes, here is Steve Richards, Gulf War Hotel Papa Echo. They called March the 13th, 1989, the day the sun brought darkness. On that day, a powerful coronal mass ejection, a CME, hit Earth's magnetic field. 90 seconds later, in Canada, the Hydro-Quebec power grid failed. During the nine-hour blackout that followed, millions of Quebecois found themselves with no light or heat, wondering what was going on. It was the biggest geomagnetic storm of the space age, said Dr. David Bottelet, head of the Space Weather Group at Natural Resources Canada. March 1989 has become the archetypical disturbance for understanding how solar activity can cause blackouts. After darkness engulfed Quebec, bright auroras spread as far south as Florida, Texas and Cuba. Reportedly, some onlookers thought that they were witnessing a nuclear exchange. Others thought it had something to do with the space shuttle, which remarkably launched on the same day. The astronauts were okay, although the shuttle did experience a mysterious problem with a fuel cell sensor that threatened to cut the mission short. NASA has never officially linked the sensor anomaly to the solar storm. It seems hard to believe now, but in 1989, few people realized solar storms could bring down power grids. The warning bells had been ringing for more than a century, though. In September 1859, a similar CME hit Earth's magnetic field, the infamous Carrington event, sparking a storm twice as strong as that of March 1989. Electrical currents surged through Victorian-era telegraph wires, in some cases causing sparks and setting telegraph offices on fire. These were the same kind of currents that would bring down Hydro-Quebec. The March 1989 blackout was a wake-up call for our industry, said Dr. Emmanuel Barnabou of PJM, a regional utility company that coordinates the flow of electricity in 13 US states. Now we take geomagnetically induced currents very seriously, he said. The next Quebec-level storm is just a matter of time. In fact, we could be overdue. But if Barnabu is correct, this time the sun won't bring darkness, only light. If you're interested in finding out more about the mechanisms that bring about these significant effects, head over to spaceweather.com and seek out the article, The Great Quebec Blackout. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland. 
serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.